Okay, this is the first of three videos that we're going to do for our, our second Gauss's Law unit this week. And we're going to do them in sets of three because I want to break them up so that you can go back to the thing that you need uh, if you ever need to go back and look at it. Especially because we are looking at planar, spherical, and cylindrically symmetric charge distribution. So right now we're going to look at spherical, which is uh, a spherical shell or a solid sphere. And we're going to look at how we can use Gauss's law with a spherical charge distribution to figure out what's going on. Okay. Now, right now we're looking at conductors. Uh, or shells. Alright, and the reason we're looking at conductors first is because they're the easiest case. So if I have a sphere, and if we pretend that that sphere is sort of a, a solid conductor, Oh, it looks like a sphere. If it's solid, <clears throat> and I put a charge of plus Q on that solid conductor, well, it's not going to float around the middle. That charge of plus Q is going to be distributed evenly across the surface of my conductor. Um, so for the sphere, a charge of plus Q will spread itself evenly and just sit on the surface. It's the same thing as if I had um, a very big old spherical shell. It's where it was just a shell with a little bit of cutout and there was nothing on the inside. All of that charge would just be on the surface. It doesn't want to distribute itself into the middle. So when we look at a conductor, all the charge sits in one place. We don't have to worry about it varying yet. We will have to. Now, this, is some, this gives us some nice things about the spherical conducting shell. If all that charge is right here and it's evenly distributed throughout it, and, and this is something to keep in mind, for all conductors, the surface is an equipotential. On the surface of any charge conductor, because of the fact that charges want to spread out, the surface, the surface of that conductor is an equipotential. Um, and we can talk a lot more about that in class. But what that means is that every point on the surface of this sphere, the potential is the same. And which means that the electric field, if it's positively charged, is always perpendicular to the surface. Okay? So, conducting shells. That's the thing we have to look at. Right now we're looking at spherical charge distributions. So, let's get into it. Pretend we have a solid sphere of charge plus Q. What we're going to do is find, find the electric field, we'll call that point P, at point P. No, we're not. We're going to start this slide over. Uh, boom. No, we're not. Yeah, it doesn't do it. So right here we have spherically symmetric charge. And what we want is to find the electric field as a function of our inside and outside of the sphere. Both of those are important things. So our sphere has radius just to make our lives easier, big R. So we want E inside and E outside of that. So let's start off with outside. Let's start off with the case where we want the electric field at points where our, the radius to our point R is greater than the radius of the sphere. That's outside. So what we're gonna do is put up one of those Gaussian surfaces. This Gaussian surface that makes the most sense is a symmetric sphere. I didn't draw it symmetrically, but you get the idea. It's a symmetrical sphere. And because of that, the electric field passes through this thing perpendicularly at all points in and out of the page. And the electric field is constant 
because it's the equal distance away from this thing. So we know we have an electric field passing through this sphere. We know that it's passing through at 90 degrees, and we know that it's constant. So here's what we have. We have Gauss's law that says the integral of the electric field with respect to the area, the flux through this blue Gaussian sphere that we drew, is equal to the enclosed charge. Well, inside of this sphere, how much charge do I have? Plus Q. Plus Q divided by epsilon naught. Well, we said E was constant. So it's E times the integral of dA. Well, if I add up all the tiny pieces of that, if I add up all the tiny pieces of the dA along this thing, what I get is just the surface area of the sphere, which is 4 pi times r squared. And that's equal, again, to plus q, my enclosed charge, over epsilon naught. So if I solve for my electric field here, I get that my electric field is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times q over r squared. 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r squared. Now, <clears throat> that should look familiar if I make a simple substitution. Uh, kq over r squared. 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught is the same thing as k. So I know my electric field at points outside. Inside's even better. For the inside, I'm going to draw a Gaussian sphere inside of the shell. So if I'm looking at the electric field where r is less than the radius of my shell, okay, uh, what I see, well, I've got e dot dA is equal to q enclosed over epsilon naught. We just said all the charge is sitting on the surface of our sphere. If that's the case, then for this red thing, I'm not enclosing any charge. For any time that r is less than r, I have zero charge. So if that's zero, I know the area is not zero. The electric field inside must be equal to zero. I have a little bit of discontinuity here, but uh, if I were to look at a graph, I'll do a really quick one, of the electric field with respect to r, and this was the surface of that sphere, I'd have, and we'll do it another color, zero electric field. And then I'd have one that started off like kq over r squared. And so it'd jump up and decrease. That's what that would look like as a function. Because I don't have any charge until I get to the surface of the sphere. Now that's finding the electric field.